Today's video is sponsored by Squarespace, but more on that in a bit. Hello and welcome back to another installment in our rare power computing Macintosh clone, Extreme, Extreme Upgrade, Upgrade Extravaganza. Extravaganza. If you haven't seen the previous two episodes, here's a quick recap of where we are in this totally bonkers build. We've swapped out the noisy and tiny SCSI hard drive for a SCSI to SD, mounted in a 3D printed bracket that we designed and accessible from the back of the case. We've also swapped out the system fan for a nice silent Noctua, and the RAM has been maxed out to one gigabyte, an absolutely ridiculous number for a machine that came out in 1995 with all of 16 megs of RAM. Most importantly, we've been working to upgrade the bejesus out of the processor, which was originally a pokey 150 megahertz PowerPC 604. While we have this super rare one gigahertz Sonnet G4 upgrade that does work, it has some problems and doesn't stay running reliably. So we still have to diagnose this for a broken solder joint or something. In the meantime, we have a G3 500 megahertz upgrade and that's been running rock solid and it's super fast and definitely fast enough for today's rather audacious goal. We're gonna cram in this giant pile of upgrades, including getting this machine to boot from a SATA SSD. So stay tuned. And if you enjoy taking weird and rare 90s macOS machines and dragging them kicking and screaming into the modern age of the internet, I hope you'll consider subscribing to the channel. I've got some even more extreme builds in the works, and they're definitely worth sticking around for. So today's plans revolve almost entirely around these two very special cards. This is an ATI Radeon 9200 graphics card with 128 megs of VRAM. It's just about the fastest card that can work in a PCI Power Mac including our power computing clone straight out of the box. It was considered a no brainer upgrade to the big G3 and G4 towers that you're probably all familiar with, but we're gonna use it in a Mac clone from 1995. And honestly, that just strikes me as hilarious. And we're really gonna need this if we're gonna continue this build because here, let me show you something. Off camera, I've installed Mac OS 1028 Jaguar. Now, why didn't I do it on camera? Well, this machine just sitting here all day, it's really hard to just not tinker around with it. But just look at how Jaguar performs. <laughs> That's about as janky as it can be. And the heavier the application, the worse it is. Just look at that. <laughs> oh, that is terrible. So I would really hate to try to install something like 10.4 Tiger on here because with this stock 4 meg video card, that would just be a horrible mess. This other card is a super cheap, no name, PCI SATA controller card with two SATA ports on it. What's so special about that? I'm glad you asked. It's this chip right here, which is the SIL, 3112 controller chip. Cards with this silicon image chip can be flashed with a special firmware that works in both Mac OS X and the classic Mac OS, which is exceedingly rare for any SATA controller. I believe it's the firmware from the Sonnet Tempo SATA card, which uses this same controller chip. But this is gonna let us run real honest to goodness SATA SSDs and that's going to be way faster than the SCSI to SD that we're using right now. And since these cards are sometimes finicky about what SSD we put in there, I have three different SSDs just to make sure we can find one, hopefully, that works. I'll put some links below to some other videos, including an excellent video from Hrutke Mods where he goes in depth into how to flash these cards. And those of you who have been around the channel for a little while, Probably remember we tried to do this in our Power Mac G4 Ultimate MDD build and we had a whole bunch of trouble with the pre-flashed card that I bought from eBay. Well, thanks to a generous donation from viewer Jorge, we have a second card that he personally flashed and tested. So 
one of these is definitely going to work. I just know it. I also think it would be convenient to be able to access the SSD without opening up the case and swap in different ones. So I've got this super cheap PCI mobile rack, which is just a hot swap enclosure that fits into a PCI slot. So we can quickly and easily pop in and remove SATA SSDs. Oh, and we should definitely throw in this brand new USB and Firewire combo controller card while we're at it. Speaking of delightful controllers, let me tell you about how the sponsor of today's video, Squarespace, can help you take delightful control of your online presence. My professional background is in web development and online marketing, so I've worked with a ton of different platforms. The old way of doing business online was to use a haphazard daisy chain of unrelated products. It could be a frustrating experience to get them all working together. That's why I really like Squarespace. It's an all-in-one solution that both lets you build a beautiful online presence and provides powerful tools to help you run your business, including analytics, email campaigns, e-commerce, SEO tools, and more. So check out squarespace.com slash action retro and get a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, get 10% off of your first purchase of a website or domain. So I think we'll start with installing this video card, which I'm really excited about because I definitely want to use this machine for some retro gaming. And then I still really love how the entire bottom of the case comes completely off with two screws to give easy access to the PCI slots. So we'll just take out the old video card here. And slot in this super powered beast. Hopefully it's as easy as that. All right, the monitor is plugged into the VGA port on the card and everything's connected to power. So let's see if it works. All right, so we booted into Jaguar just fine, and I can already see it's picked a different resolution and a different refresh rate because I had to set my camera now to 85 hertz. And wow, look at that difference. Silky smooth. Wow. <laughs> yeah, video card, uh, as expected, makes quite a bit of a difference. Even Internet Explorer, big and bloated, is pretty nice. And we might as well make sure this boots into Mac OS 9 as well. And since we used ex post facto to cheat Mac OS 10 on here, we actually have to use that to boot back into Mac OS 9 as well. Okay, so we have jump cut to quite a while later and it's because I made an incredibly annoying mistake. I forgot that Mac OS 9.1 was the official maximum for many of these PCI Power Macs, including the Power Computing Power Wave. So when in Jaguar, I updated the classic environment to 922 and then tried to boot into it, not only did I get the this Mac is not compatible with this boot disk error message, but I had no way of booting back into 10.2 Jaguar because I didn't have ex post facto handy. So what I wound up doing was reinstalling 9.1 and then redoing the Sonnet upgrade drivers. But during that whole fiasco, while 9.1 was installing, I had some free time and I made use of it. And I have some incredibly good news. I was able to use my phone as a magnifying glass and hunt around on the one gigahertz upgrade looking for the broken solder joint and I found it. And then all it took was a bit of flux and uh, a quick reflowing with my soldering iron and it works. In fact, we're booted into it right now. See, here's the G3 upgrade right here. And if we take a look at Apple system profiler, check this out. Machine speed is 1000 megahertz or one gigahertz. 
And we have our one gig of RAM. That's amazing. So we've basically done it. We have our one gigahertz power computing clone with one gig of RAM. There's just one slight problem, which I'll show you right now. If we boot into Mac OS 10, our 10.2.8 Jaguar install, which works just fine on the G3 500, but no matter what I set this to, I get this, open firmware complaining, can't load from this device. So I don't actually know what's wrong with this, but I've trial and errored pretty much every setting in ex post facto. But I think what we'll try to do is install our SATA controller card and try to install a bootable SSD and try to get Tiger on here and see if Tiger can't solve whatever this problem is. And if that doesn't work, well, we'll put our G3 500 back in there and get everything configured to work perfectly and then troubleshoot this one gigahertz card once again. Now, as always, the reasonable approach would be to install one card at a time and test it, but I don't like to do that. So I'm just gonna throw all these cards in where I'd like them to go. And if they don't work, then we can troubleshoot. But I wanna put the Firewire and USB right in the middle here. with that lovely purple PCB and our SATA controller card with its blank front plate can go right at the end here. And we'll test it out with this first hard drive. This is a King DN 60 gigabyte drive, which is the perfect size for what we're doing here. And it's made out of actual metal, so pretty sweet. We have a SATA cable here, which will connect to the first SATA port. And then for power, I've got one of these little Molex adapter deals that we can just plug in right here. And there we go, an SSD. So let's try to power this thing up and see if we can initialize the SSD. Uh, yes, <laughs> as a matter of fact, it does see it. Oh, look at that, this was once my multi-boot firewire drive, which these partitions got messed up, so it doesn't actually boot anymore. So yeah, let's use it. That's awesome, <laughs> SATA works. Look at that. This is a SATA drive with 60 gigs available. <laughs> Native SATA in a 1995 PCI Macintosh clone. <laughs> that's, that's just ridiculous and amazing. Let's call this Mac SATA. So we have Mac SD and Mac SATA. So what I think I'm going to do, how I'm going to organize this, is Mac SD is going to be kind of the recovery drive. So it'll always be able to boot into Mac OS 9 on the SD card, which is connected directly to the SCSI bus, no matter what goes wrong. And Mac SATA is gonna be our advanced operating systems. So we're gonna start out trying to put Tiger on here and uh, then see how far we can take it. All right, let's make this even more ridiculous. These are super drives out of a G5 tower. Can we read these through SATA in Mac OS 9. Let's find out. All right. <laughs> I have the top drive connected. And in case this somehow works, I have my boxed retail copy of 10.4 Tiger, which is on an install DVD that we can try to install. <laughs> The drive opens because obviously it's connected to power. That's not that impressive. There we go. Original install media. No piracy in the action retro layer. And we even have iWork 05 in case we want to create, present, and publish our work with style. 
Although it's only the trial version because I guess Apple are cheapskates. All right, boot it back up into 9.1. Let's see if it sees a DVD. Oh my God, look, <laughs> it worked. <laughs> it sees the DVD-ROM drive from a, a Mac G5 over SATA. <laughs> That's so funny. All right, so we have SATA DVD, and you know what we're going to do now? We're going to leave this machine in this Druaga 1 pile of parts state, and we're going to use ex post facto and try to install Tiger onto the SATA SSD. All right, so I think it would be smarter to install macOS 9.1 on the SATA SSD first and just make sure we can boot off of it before we go through the trouble of trying to get Tiger to boot. So, yep, select Mac SATA just fine. Available disk space, 57 gigs. <laughs> it's pretty sweet. And install. Okay, so it starts to boot off of SATA, but then we get a divide by zero error, which I don't know why it would do that, but we get that as soon as it starts trying to load extensions. So I wonder if the Sonnet extension for some reason, it doesn't like the SATA drive? I don't know, but let's try restarting and uh, holding down shift to turn off extensions. All right, well, it does boot with extensions off. And uh, I think that should be good enough to let us try and install 10.4 Tiger. So we'll pop in our install DVD and see if it works. All right, well, that didn't work, so I booted back into the SD card and opened up ex post facto. Let's just try to boot from the install DVD and install it that way. So we'll leave the throttle off for now, and we'll see if it uh, will actually boot. All right, we're getting the same kind of message. Can't load from this device. Okay, so I could not get it to boot from the DVD with the one gigahertz card installed. So I took that out and put the 500 megahertz G3 card back in. And now it does boot into the beginning stages of the Tiger installer, but we get hung up on this still waiting for root device, which is confusing to me because that means it can't find the device it's trying to boot the OS from. However, further up in this text here, It does find the DVD RW drive, which is what it's booting from. So I don't know what that's about. Well, I remembered that I just so happened to own a SCSI DVD ROM in beige, no less. And it let us boot into the Tiger retail install DVD. So let's install Tiger onto the SATA hard drive. Okay, it is Friday afternoon, that's right, the day before I'm posting this very video, and I have been fighting with this machine all week, trying to get it to both install 10.4 Tiger and then boot it reliably. And now, at the 11th hour, I finally got it working. Now, I won't show all the tedious trial and error it took to get to this point, but instead, I'll just let you know the final settings for everything on this machine that finally got it booting. First, I was messing around with the SSD and I wound up taking this drive out because while I was able to install Tiger on this 60 gig drive, it wouldn't boot afterwards. It would give me all kinds of errors in weird places and sometimes almost get to the loading screen, but not quite. So I swapped it out for one of these 120 gigabyte A data drives and had the same issue. After some research, it turns out that the SIL3112 chipset on this PCI SATA controller card acts like a SCSI controller to the Mac, or at least the Mac sees it as if it were a SCSI controller. So that got me thinking. It's common knowledge that on these machines, Mac OS and OS 9 have to be on an 8GB or smaller partition 
Otherwise, the machine can have strange behavior. So I tried that. I formatted the drive with a 7 gig boot drive called Max SATA, and then the rest of the drive as a SATA storage. So I have two partitions on here, and I think that was a big part of the issue. The other thing I did was tweak the ex post facto settings. So the one that works here for the 1 gigahertz card seems to be to turn off L2 and L3 cache during the boot process and then set the throttling to 9. But now we have it. Not only is it booting, but it boots every single time, albeit kind of slowly. But check it out. About this Mac, I was able to upgrade this and install all of the Tiger patches. So we're at 10.4.11. And yeah, 1 gigahertz PowerPC G4 with 1 gig of RAM. <laughs> That's just absolutely incredible. I cannot believe it. And we can run stuff like 10.4 Fox and go on the modern internet. And I was even able to post to Twitter from this machine using the regular Twitter interface. I, this machine is from 1995. That's absolutely incredible. So what do I think of this machine with its lovely G4 processor at 1 gigahertz and beefy video card with 128 megs of RAM? Well, it is... Uh, not as fast as I was hoping or especially doing something like running a modern web browser like 10.4 Fox and going on a modern heavy JavaScript site like Twitter, it is almost unbearably slow. And yes, I was able to tweet from it, but after quite a wait to even type into the Twitter text box. So if you're looking for a machine for Twitter or Gmail or Facebook, yeah, a 1995 power computing, even upgraded as far as it can possibly go, is not the machine for you. However, just having this machine at this speed is incredible. I mean, the fact that you can run Tiger at all in a usable state on a machine from 1995, it's just absolutely incredible. Now, I ran Geekbench 2.3 to take some benchmarks and the results are pretty interesting. We got just a 214. Now, of course, we can't compare that to a before score because literally a before score was not possible because this software wouldn't run on this machine without all these upgrades and without Tiger. But this 214 puts us in the league of, well, very low end Power Mac G4s, which of course those G4s are a good five to 10 years ahead of this power computing machine, but still this is a one gigahertz machine kind of scoring around where a 450 megahertz G4 tower might score. And I think the reason is right here. This machine is limited by its 50 megahertz system bus, which is, well, about as slow as you can get. That was, kind of mediocre even in 1995. So running software from the mid 2000s, yeah, it's still a struggle even at one gigahertz. So that'll do it for this video. And I just have to say, this is an absolute dream build for me. I've had so much fun, even throughout all the frustration, building this machine and getting everything to work. And I am so excited that I did finally get everything to work. 10411 Tiger on a 1995 power computing power wave that's been upgraded to one gigahertz. <laughs> it's just so cool. But I'll have an important question for all of you in the near future involving these Macintosh clones because we're not done with them yet. But we are done with this video for this week. So if you enjoyed it, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more Power Mac clone shenanigans like this, please subscribe down below. And thank you very much for watching. And a special thanks to Chris Algreta, Tom Stig124, Justin D. Morgan, Greg Rutke, Chris Calderon, and Nick Hamsey, who are my highest tiered patrons and all of my Patreon supporters who help to make these videos possible.